Hi, everyone. Thank you for coming to today's talk with Dean Eileen Strempel. My name is Lam Liu. I'm a retiree resource specialist at the UCLA Emeriti Retirees Relations Center. Our office reports to the Vice Chancellor of Academic Personnel and serves over 16,000 retired faculty, staff, campus, and community partners. Our staff is composed of our director, Aisha Dixon, my colleague, Maria Lubrano, and myself. Um, our usual host, Aisha, couldn't be here today as she is currently enjoying a much, much deserved vacation in Europe. Um, before we get started, I just want to take care of a few things first. Um, Dean Eileen Strempel um, seems to want to have a live discussion, so you may type your questions in the chat or you know, just join in the discussion as we go along. Um, this program will be recorded and archived to our YouTube channel, so if you haven't subscribed yet, I will be linking it in the chat. I will also send the link to the video, and Dean Strempel does have um, some slides prepared, and I can also email that afterwards to you. Um, feel free to take any breaks you need. Um, and without further ado, I'd like to hand this over to our partner, Michael Heafy from the Retirees Association. Greetings, everyone. Thank you for joining us. We got a real treat today. The inaugural dean of the Herb Alpert School of Music at UCLA, Eileen Strempel. This is a first both for her and for the campus to have someone of her caliber and credits with the direction she is steering the school, which we were going to find more, find out more about right now. So Dean Strempel, if I may call you Eileen, just to, as a matter of casual acquaintance, um, please take it away. Welcome, everyone, and thank you so, so much for inviting me. It's a real honor and pleasure, and I, I look forward to be able to uh, continue the conversation in person. But um, uh, just want to give you a little bit of background, because um, I, I actually, um, uh, as, as our wonderful host, Michael, has been kindly sharing, um, I actually started out as, a, as an opera singer. Um, and uh, Later, when I went back to school after um, working as an opera singer for many years uh, to finish my doctorate, I actually became really interested in music by women composers. And um, my uh, my dissertation was actually on a, a, a woman, a French composer named Marie de Grandval, who was um, a, you know hung around with Chopin and Liszt, and was a real uh, friends with Pauline Verdot Garcia, and was very much a part of the salon culture of 19th century Paris. Um, and this may seem like an odd leap, but uh, I discerned pretty quickly that probably Beethoven and Mozart were going to be fine without me. But I really loved the curation, the, the finding of the fabulous qualities um, and just the amazing impact that uh, lesser known composers, women composers specifically, had had. And perhaps it's that same kind of um, love for the underdog, if you will, that really uh, started my journey into um, public policy and higher education, which actually started a couple of decades ago. I started to work, um, I was uh, I was associate dean of the graduate school at Syracuse University at the time and started to work for transfer students and advocacy as part of a seven institution uh, collaboration that was an NSF funded grant and all about how do we build pipelines from community colleges into four-year institutions to enhance the degree attainment in, of our populace. And, um, you know, I never knew anything about transfer students before then, so it was a whole new topic area for me, and I fell in love. I really started to understand the promise of higher education and what it can mean for all of us in a completely different light. And um, my co-author, Stephen Handel, and I, uh, for the last couple of years, um, have been working on a book that just came out with Rowan Littlefield Press called Beyond Free College, Making Higher Education Work for 21st Century Students. And what we were trying to do is we kind of started out inspired by um, the GI Bill in 1945. So as you'll recall, you know, we had all of these service men and women, and it was mostly men that took the benefit, um, let me be clear, uh, that returned um, after their time serving in the war. And America 
between 1940 and 1950 doubled the population of Americans with degrees, doubled in 10 years. And it is surprising, but um, the, uh, it, at that point, after in that time period from 1945 to 1950, literally 50% of all people in higher education were veterans. Um, and so we were started with that as a kind of uh, point. And here I'll do the boring thing of actually reading something because I think it's beautiful. Um, and this is really set, you know, setting the stage with the GI Bill. In an era when advanced education seemed out of reach for most Americans, the GI Bill's education and training provisions made it accessible and did so through broadly inclusive eligibility features and implementation that treated re recipients with dignity and respect as rights-bearing beneficiaries. Both of these aspects conveyed to citizens that government is for and about people like them, buttressing further the idea of, of a common citizenship. Driving home the bill's message of civic inclusion, the education and training provisions, enhanced life opportunities, and the standard of living, particularly among recipients from low and middle working class backgrounds, thus elevating their civic involvement most of all. Government's role in this process was clear and unambiguous. And through all of these dynamics, the bill expanded the bounds of the actively engaged citizenry. And so, you know, it was really, I mean, what inspirational language, right? Having people in society believe that government, they're not skeptical about it. It's a positive force. It is transforming society, not just, it's not reduced to a mere educational transaction, but something that is turning people into American citizens engaged and, so, um, and, and civically engaged, giving back, literally making up the greatest generation. So, um, you know, where does that leave us today? Just to take a big leap. Boy, it's a different landscape, folks. Um, but it is a moment, I believe, we have to double down on the transformative aspect of secondary education. So um, there's a really famous Pell report. So Pell grants are the grants that the government gives to low-income families, families that are making less than $30,000 a year. Um, but a student, from the bottom quartile of income has only an 11% chance of completing a college degree. Let me put that a different way. That means if you're in the lowest income quartile, the quartile, you have a 90% chance pretty much of not making it, of not getting that life enhancing transformative degree that is gonna give you a life, a possibility as a life family sustaining wage, right? 90%. So here it is, the key belief of our book is really, how do we guarantee that access to higher education is actually meeting the needs of today's students? And we actually coined a term when we were writing the book um, and we came up with the term neo-traditional student, kind of like the new normal. Who are the students that, are, that were now accessing education? And over 70% are low income, first generation, students from historically underrepresented communities, dreamers, veterans, and or parents, and post uh, later than a traditional college age student, so over the age of 25, 70%. Now strolling on the UCLA campus, we're in a rarefied bubble. You wouldn't believe that figure. 70%, more than 70%, but believe it or not, if, we're, uh, if you're in a community college, 50% of the students there, close to 50% are parenting students. The, chain, the face of today's students have changed. And so if you think about the GI Bill and what we did as a country, we as citizens did, is the vets came back and they received money from the government, right? But that money didn't just cover their tuition, right? It also allowed for them to have money for housing money for books, money to live on, and actually enough money so that at that time, pretty much a, always a stay-at-home mom would be able to actually even raise a family while you were going to school. So we've done it before, right? But unless we start to think about how we start to think about these life supports, 
food insecurity, housing insecurity, childcare, um, we're not going to actually start to move the dial on educational attainment, right? It's not that that's not that those students or prospective students don't want to go to college. Not at all. The desire is there. Um, but the actual support to actually get them through the door and over across the threshold, like the many students graduating today at UCLA, um, that's actually not really possible without those life supports. But what we found out in the book, um, in writing the book and all the research that we did, was that actually what we need to think about is not free college, right? That's the kind of title, Beyond Free College. Actually, free. Free, isn't a, free is not really an issue, right? Most students can go to a community college with right down the street, right? There are, there are access points, they're, they're, they're local, they're cheap, they're accessible, right? With a, with a Pell Grant, they're, they are free, but that doesn't help. Why? Because you still have to pay to live, you still have to buy your books, you still have to worry about childcare. So if we don't, if we have to think beyond, we have to really think about something different. And that is, we came up with a, in the book was, the cost per degree. And again, kind of surprising statistic is that, yeah, okay, it, it costs more, right? You gotta provide more money, more funding for higher education access. But the cost per degree goes down because so many more people complete. And the return on the investment to the American taxpayer is roughly on a rate of three or four to one because those families have their lives now transformed, right? They get, they, they, they move from not being able to access higher education, having a, having a job when they graduate that pays more. So they pay more in taxes. They're less likely to be incarcerated. They're likely to, more likely to be civically engaged. And here's the kind of incalculable cost then their kids are much more likely to go to college, right? So it's one of these amazing virtuous cycle. So when they say three or four dollars uh, to one return, it's actually a gross underestimate. So really the whole ethos is based in this kind of um, historic and dramatic investment in higher education made at the point of return from World War II. So we had some really big takeaways and then I'll, I'll kind of run through a bunch of these and then just kind of open for questions. Um, one is really, you know, we got to stop thinking about just tuition as how we're measuring free. You know, that's, that's not, it's not counting actually what we want. Doesn't every company think about how much it costs to produce their end product? Um, any company that I know of does. And so what we as a country really have to start thinking about how much does it cost to produce that degree? That be the metric. And Number two is that degree completion should always be our aim, right? Even though we celebrate the open access possibilities of community colleges, um, we really have to remain focused on the degree completion. And in the time of COVID, we've gone from 36 million Americans with some college and no degree to 39 million. So it's been a huge, huge shift. So, um, thinking about some of the findings, right? So really it starts back in the high school. We've got to incentivize in high schools. We have to incentivize students to complete really rigorous coursework, honors level. Um, we have to ensure that honors level courses are available to all students, regardless of high school location. It'll come to no one's surprise that a lot of those rigorous courses aren't available and except in the most wealthy school districts. Um, and we have to actually let people know, let students know when they're in high school, are they really on track to be college ready? Um, big findings around dual enrollment. So dual enrollment is when those high school students are taking college classes. I'm sure you've heard about that in the news. Um, and uh, you know, states love to pump that up. It's just a wonderful thing. But the research doesn't back that up, except when those dual enrollment courses are taught by college faculty on the college campus. So this whole idea that we're gonna take some high school student and give them a little additional training and they're gonna teach a college level course, a complete waste of money. When you look at college completion rates, persistence, time to degree, graduation rates, it doesn't move the dial at all. We spend a ton of money on higher education that actually research shows is a very poor investment. 
But we do know that if those dual enrollment courses bring students to campus, get them in the college environment, that they're taught by a college faculty member, those have incredible value. They really move the dial. Another kind of interesting finding, and here I'm just going to admit I was totally skeptical in the beginning, um, it's something called prior learning assessment or PLA. Um, and prior learning assessment kind of sounds, sounds weird, right? Um, but what it is, is that if you think about it, first of all, in a traditional sense, it's when, you know, my kids, I want them to go off and have internships when they're in college, right? I think like, hey, they're going to find out what it looks like in the real world, you know, and it's true. Those students go out, they figure out through that internship, whether it's paid or unpaid, what are the things I want to study more? Oh, now I see why that's relevant. I should be paying more attention to that, right? We, they do all kinds of learning. And we have, as institutions across the country, found ways to transcript and give academic credit for those internships. So we kind of do this. And what I want to encourage us off is to do the other way, to take the workplace earning, learning that we've just transcripted for the traditional student and put an equity lens to it and make sure that we provide that same type of uh, rigorous academic uh, assessment so that we're taking the work-based learning of working adults and giving them credit, awarding credit for those learning. And it's fascinating. Research replicated across the country um, shows that students who are awarded nine prior learning assessment credits are two and a half times as likely to graduate. Not like 10% more, 50% more, two and a half times as likely to graduate. So it makes a huge difference. People feel like their, their life experience is, is uh, validated and, and treated seriously. Um, we also need to be looking at how we make sure that transfer credits actually are accepted by receiving institutions. A lot of students are forced to repeat courses that they've already taken, have to pay for them again. And the, it, it's a huge equity issue for any student that transfers, they lose out. And who are the most likely students to be transfer students? Two thirds of them, first generation, close to two thirds of them, Pell eligible, largely historically underrepresented student populations. And so it's, a, it's really an equity issue, transfer portability of those academic classes. Um, you know, we all changed around in, uh, in the pandemic. Everyone who said they were never going to teach online, we all taught online and with a couple days notice, much, much to our utter dismay. It was not a good thing. Um, can, can, let's not confuse Zoom learning with actually uh, rigorously designed online courses. And research actually shows that having online courses that have AI embedded support. So, um, you know, it starts to understand like, oh, Eileen isn't so good with this particular form of math problem and will specifically help and drill until I really understand the concept before moving on. Those types of artificial intelligence embedded in course design make a huge difference. Plus having place-based supports, whether it's tutoring or things like that. So it really does have a huge place, um, but it has to be done right. And the accessibility that it provides to students who, whether they have um, any form of disability, whether they have transportation or childcare issues, again, it just makes it much more accessible for people. Um, and really, uh, you know, thinking about the students of today, those neo traditional students, we have to figure out as a country how to best serve them. Right, how to provide those life supports that I talked about at the beginning. Um, what we saw in the community colleges first, that's what we're now seeing on our four year campuses in the pandemic time. Right, I think the community colleges are the harbingers of the directions that the country is going to be having to face in many ways. And so, we're very wise to look at some of the visionary leaders of community colleges who are far ahead of the real world, um, the rarefied world that many four year institutions inhabit. But Ultimately, if we don't learn how to serve those students, the students that are better, we're going to have to close our doors um, because they are the future of American higher education. Um, and there are some wonderful models about how to do that. The CUNY ASAP program um, is probably one of the most famous, um, rigorously uh, researched and tested. And you know, as I said, that whopping three to four dollars of return for every one dollar invested in students enrolled in that ASAP program. 
they do all the right things, right? Courses are blocked in the morning or in the evening to accommodate the schedules of working adults. You're, you have to meet with your advisor regularly, but when you do, they give you a free Metro card so your transportation to class is covered. Your textbooks are covered. You have living costs. They hook you up with childcare. You know, it's it's really taking into view the whole life of the student. Um, I think another thing that we're going to continue to see is the lifelong learning of these neo traditional students because we do have those 39 million now Americans with some college and no degree. Many of those with student loan debt. Um, and there are some wonderful models there. Brigham Young University has a whole pathway connect that really reframes the whole curriculum in the way that we teach on college campuses so that you start with a certificate, say maybe it's in uh, retail management, and then you have an associate's degree in business that builds to a bachelor's degree in business. The idea is that wherever you are, if you stop out, you already have a, a wage enhancing credential. And you do save the general education courses till the junior and senior year. Maybe it's probably better for the students to be waiting to take some of those courses. Maybe they're more intellectually and emotionally ready for those classes. Um, but dramatic increases, both in retention and graduation rates by just something as simple as flipping the curriculum. Um, so we really need to, to think about how we connect higher education to the life of, of working adults. Um, it is survival for neo-traditional students, but it's also partly survival for institutions, especially more vulnerable institutions with less brand name recognition for, um, for institutions that are, uh, you know, predominantly master's degree serving institutions. Um, because really at the end of the day, are you gonna, is the marketplace 20 years from now, going to value a degree, let's say in hotel management, is it going to mean more from Cornell or from the Four Seasons? Um, you know, you can extract that and think about it in a lot of different ways. But unless we really think about prior learning assessment, work based learning, and incorporating that as a bridge back into higher education, we're going to continue to have education tragically start to reinforce economic inequality rather than serve as the powerful and ameliorating force that it can be. So I'll stop there and, and just welcome any questions. And uh, I can see that I'm really passionate about this and uh, uh, love this work very, very much. And the next research books, books three, books uh, four and five are already uh, in the work. So I'm, it's something I continue to, uh, to spend a lot of time thinking about. So thank you for letting me just uh, talk a little bit off the top of my head here, but uh, just to walk you through some of those big findings. Yeah, Victoria, please dive right in. Oh, thank you. Um, and thank you for um, giving focus to the work that the community colleges do. They really are doing God's work out, out there. And, you know, I would say also the CSUs in California, um, that whole system, first generation, um, really pe helping people advance. I wanted to share something interesting that I just learned yesterday. And that is that UCLA started out as a community college. It when it opened, in, did you know that? You must have known that. Nope. that I don't know if the others on, um, on the Zoom are aware of that, but when our campus started, in um, the current location of LA Community College. <laughs> at LA Community College, exactly. And um, I wanted to just share with the group that I went down to visit LACC recently because if I've ever been on that campus, I didn't remember it very well. And I'm interested in the antecedents of UCLA. And one thing that um, I'm particularly interested in about LACC at the moment is uh, this. I have a friend who is named Carl Schlossberg. He's a curator um, and a visionary, great guy. And he's made, a, made it his mission to bring artwork to LACC. And so I've gotten interested in this. At UCLA, we have two world-class museums, a world-class sculpture garden, and 500 pieces of public art on our campus. LACC has three, mm -hmm. um, you know? Mm -hmm. And when you walk around that campus, the 
vibe of the place is so much about aspiration. It's very touching. I mean, it's palpable. So anyway, thank you for thinking about those folks. And oh. I hope other people will also remember how important, especially like LICC and, and others too, but in the heart of, you know, downtown. Um, oh, I do have a question for you. I, um, I think, did you say that 50% of co uh, community college students are parents? Did I get that wrong? Nope. No, 50% are parents. Nope. Astounding wow. statistics. Um, if you look at the national averages of all uh, students enrolled in post-secondary education, depend, in the last couple of years, it's ranged between 26 and 27% of all American college students. But when you narrow that to the community college, it's 50%. Yeah. It's a huge, I mean, I had no idea before uh, starting the research in this book that really more than a quarter of all college students are parents. Boy, do I live in a rarefied bubble. You know, just, you don't always, um, you don't always, you know, for me, I don't know what I don't know sometimes. Um, and it's, it's, writing this book has been very humbling. I will um, give the school a shout out here for our relationship with LA Community College. Um, our same, the same naming donor um, funded um, and endowed scholarships for music students at LACC. So they are tuition free there. Oh. I've dedicated and set aside funds um, from the Herb Alpert Endowment that, to fund uh, it's only transfer students to oh. really help foster what I see as UCLA's really embodying in the 21st century what it means to be a public urban serving institution. And I'm proud to say that in my tenure here, the number of transfer students has increased by 87%. Oh, that's so great. And actually, yeah, I was give thinking... money, give, give money to transfer students. Yes. <laughs> They get because they get sticker shock when they come to a four year institution, they find the whole idea of how am I going to pay for it overwhelming. You really want to continue to double down on the promise of community colleges, give the give that money to dedicate it to transfer students enrolling in four year institutions. Mm -hmm. The wage, the lifelong wage earning enhancement um, is huge. Uh, so uh, you really trans over the course of a lifetime, they'll earn more than a million dollars more. I don't mean to um, be uh, hogging the no. question, but I was actually very interested in whether or not um, there was uh, the musical arts um, were being supported uh, in the community college. And so thank you, you answered that no, question. Not, not so, enough. And I really, like, I just urge you all, and as you're thinking about your own phil philanthropy, yeah. that really is a way to move the dial. Um, and I feel so strongly here at the Herb Albert School of Music that, um, you know, unless we're really careful about our investments, and that's why I've dedicated these funds in the way that I have, um, we risk as a nation, our artists becoming very elitist and not representative of our broader society. And that would be a huge, huge loss. Thank you. That's wonderful. Yeah, I had a, uh, an interesting idea about how to start in high school to funnel to community colleges and then on to finish in a four year. Is there an effort somewhere to be able to do that? Uh, usually people, programs fo focus on specific uh, transition points. So from high school to college or college to graduate school or into the workforce, but there's not a nationwide effort that really stitches all the full, um, the whole pipeline of talent uh, together. No, there isn't. We have lots of individual program efforts. That would be a good idea. So if you have some money, so. <laughs> Well, that kind of brings up another question. Uh, I used to work at Anderson School, of course, School of Management, yeah. and the dean spent a lot of time there fundraising, beating the bushes for alumni and business donors to help bolster the school's income. Is that part of your milieu as well? I probably spend at least half my time fundraising, yep. I sure do. Um, that's, you know, it's the only way with the continued public divestment in higher education that we've suffered across America and not just in California here. Um, you know, it, philanthropy plays an increasingly important role in being able to fulfill our mission and reach 
all the students. Um, you know, and I just fervently believe that money shouldn't be the barrier that keeps people from really accessing excellence. Yeah, you know, that's probably the best part of my job, raising money for students. Well, I have to admit the students that we have been privileged to hear, whether they're uh, Professor O'Farrell or Resonance, the acapella group, or uh, the ethnomusicology students, they've all been fantastic performers. Oh, that's great. That warms my heart. I'm just uh, so, so happy that they get a chance to, to, to share their, their craft with you. It's just amazing. But I'm happy to take any other questions. I don't, also don't want to keep you on a nice, bright, sunny day. And um, you know, I want to be sensitive to Zoom fatigue. So it sets in a lot. You know, when you're face to face, there's all this energy. And um, you know, sometimes that's harder on Zoom. So I want to be sensitive too. Well, and, and I don't want to hog all the questions either. But I have one regarding the, uh, does the US still aid its veterans uh, a la the GI Bill? that followed World War II? It does, it does actually provide for, for um, GI benefits and institutions are certified for being veteran friendly. Um, so yes, that is an investment that still exists, but it's it's not of the, the and we argue in our book, um, you know, it's just not the scale, right? It's so limited. Compare that to the 1940s and 1950s when, as I said, you know, by the time 1950 rolls around, 50% of American college students are being funded with the GI Bill, 50%. So, you know, if we're even just thinking about the, the true access uh, and success of our lowest income quartile, boy, if we wanna move the dial on systemic intergenerational poverty at scale, this is the way to do it. The research is clear. Yeah, please, Victoria. Oh, you're muted, Victoria. Sorry. Um, well, you're so passionate. I'm sure you're a great fundraiser, and it's really nice to hear someone speak up for the fun of that and the importance of that and how you can achieve a vision by means of um, getting out there and telling your story. So, oh. brava, bravissima. Oh. <laughs> Grazie mille. <laughs> Prego, we should let you go. Oh. Thank you again. Well, thank you, everyone. Enjoy today's joyous doctoral hooding. If you're around campus, you'll see lots of happy people and all their families. So um, just spread the joy of the season and my, my deep appreciation to all of you. Thank you so much. You're very kind. Thank you. And Bye. have a great commencement weekend. Oh, I know it looking forward. It's the best season of the year.